All right, so now we're going to be finishing up the effect sizes lecture with part two, so continued. And we're going to be talking about effect sizes related to correlation. We're also going to talk about converting between effect sizes. We're going to talk about what affects the precision of an effect size. And then we're going to talk about how you're going to be getting some practice with all of these concepts, which you'll be doing with calculations assign calculation assignments one and two this week, which I'll talk about at the end. So the correlation effect size. So the effect size for this type is going to be rho, which is that first symbol on that slide there. It looks sort of like a P, but it's actually the rho symbol. And so the primary source for that effect size is going to be R. So it's going to be a bivariate correlation <coughs> between two variables. <coughs> so we can get a sense of this if what we have is means, standard deviations, and ends for two groups. So let's say that you are wanting to do a study, a meta, on whether or not health outcomes have anything to do with whether or not someone is religious or not. So let's say that there's a group that says that they are religious and there's a group that says that they are not religious. We could then compare their health outcomes if we had the means and standard deviations for those two groups. We can also look at two by two contingency or frequency tables. These are actually a bit more possible. So if you have a religious group and a non-religious group and some sort of health outcome, let's say if they're diagnosed with a terminal illness or not, so that health outcome is gonna be dichotomous, so yes or no to being diagnosed with a terminal illness, and then that religiosity is going to be dichotomized to yes, religious, no, not religious. We can also look at this with chi-square. So as long as it's based off of a 2 by 2 contingency table or frequency table, you can use that. Um, one of the frequent questions that we get is, you know, how do you know if it's a 2 by 2? How do you know it's not a 2 by 3 or a 2 by 4 or a 3 by 2? Um, if the degrees of freedom is one, then it's gonna be a two by two table. So if they don't explicitly state that in the article, look for the degrees of freedom of one, and then you'll be able to use that as a two by two table. And then we can also look at t-tests. So these are gonna give you the same thing that means standard deviations and ends give us, and we can convert the t-test data into a row as well. So in general, there just aren't as many possibilities of data that you can get in order to compute a correlation than there are for a standardized mean difference. As we saw in the last lecture, there's about 30 different ways that you can compute a standardized mean difference. So with correlations, there's just less possibilities of how you can correlate this calculate this, sorry. For converting effect sizes, so we can convert between R and D. So if what we have is something that fell under the standardized mean difference, we can convert those effect sizes into R if the rest of our effect sizes are already in R. So we can convert from a D to an R or we can go from an R to a D. It doesn't matter. We can actually do both. Um, the same can happen with log odds to D or D to log odds. Um, so these conversions can happen in either direction. If you're moving from R to D, you actually need the R effect size or the D effect size and the variance for both of them. And you also need the sample sizes. And this one is a fairly simple conversion to do. But with 
With a log odds ratio, this is a bit more complicated. You're actually going to need the variance for both. So if we're looking at this table here, when we're looking through the literature, we can convert basically from any one of these. So we can convert from binary data to an effect size that would normally be used for continuous data. We can go from correlational data and convert it into effect sizes for continuous data. <coughs> if what we have is binary, so the two by two sorts of tables, we can actually convert that over to correlational data. Um, anytime that we have a set of effect sizes, we can calculate back and forth between them. Because that Cohen's D is the common denominator, as long as you can get a Cohen's D, you can go back and forth. You want to pick the one that the majority of your data is going to be based around. So, for example, if you wanted to examine the relationship between spirituality and depression, that's likely going to be a correlational study because you're looking at the relationship between two variables. But if we find that data not in correlational form, if we find it in these other types of effect sizes, we can convert them so that it matches the rest of the studies that we're looking at. <coughs> now we're going to talk about conversion loss. So we're going to talk about this in two different ways. So first, we can we can actually lose meaning if we use a loose set of assumptions. So if we just randomly find anything that has to do with health and anything about spirituality and convert every single one of these effect sizes without really thinking about what they're measuring in those studies, then we can actually lose the meaning of what it is that we're looking for. We want to make sure that the effect sizes um, that what it is we're combining and comparing are comparable with one another. So the basic understanding of what they were assessing was similar and fits with the parameters of what we are looking for is essential. Because if, if we have loose assumptions, so if we have study eligibility criteria that aren't stringent or very specific, then we're going to start sticking everything into our meta and we're going to lose meaning in that. The second problem that can happen with conversion loss is if we don't do that conversion, then we can actually lose a lot of the information in some of our studies. So researchers are going to look at things in different ways and those effect sizes are going to be in varied formats. So while one researcher might put it in this type of effect size format, another researcher is going to inevitably use a different one. And so by being able to convert from one effect size to another, we limit the number of studies that we lose. So that helps with that piece. So just because a majority of the studies that we pull and meet our study criteria are in one effect size, we don't have to exclude this one over here because it's in a different effect size. We can actually convert it over to this effect size that matches the rest of our studies that we're looking at. And if you do end up converting effect sizes, you'll actually want to make sure that you code for that in your coding manual for your meta. Because you're want to going to be able you're want to you're going to want to be able to look at that and ask, were those studies that were binary substantially different from those that had truly correlational data? So you're going to be assessing the impact of the conversion when you change that effect size over. And if they're not substantially different, then you'll know that you made the right decision by including them. But if you decide to exclude them, then you'll never know. And a final point, whenever it's possible and if it makes sense for your data, moving from a Cohen's D to a Hedges G is great when possible and we'll cover 
this a little bit more when it gets closer to how to interpret these results. But we talked about this in the first lecture a little bit in that Hedges G is less biased than Cohen's D and it sort of corrects for that bias. All right, so now we're going to talk about precision. So the precision of an effect size is actually primarily based on the variance. So if you look at the squares that you see at the top of the slide, granted these are not squares, they're rectangles, but let's imagine that they were squares. You would essentially see these symbols in a plot that's in a meta-analysis. And the size of the square is actually based on the variance. So the larger the variance we have, the smaller the square is going to be, and the less precise that measure is. So all in all, the less impact it's going to have on our overall effect size in the meta-analysis. And remember that the overall effect size is going to be weighted based on the sample size, which is also in turn related to variance. So the larger that box, the smaller the variance is, and the smaller the standard error is, and more than likely, the larger the sample size is going to be. So as that variance decreases, that's better. And that will also decrease the size of the confidence interval. <coughs> so remember, as that variance goes down, the box is going to get a lot bigger. So on this slide, you can see the green box would have had the smallest variance because it's the largest box. And the red box would have actually had the largest variance because it's the smallest box. So again, how precise the effect size is is directly related to the variance. And additionally, the confidence interval is denoted by the length of the line that comes out from the box in the plot in the meta-analysis. So the larger that confidence interval, the less precision that we have with that effect size. So I like to use this example when demonstrating confidence intervals. So um, I know that you can't answer me because this is a recording, but just humor me here. Um, who wants to bet their grade in this class that I am 35 years old? Any takers? If you get it right, you get an A in the class. So let's say you wanted to bet that I'm 35 years old. Would you be willing to risk your grade for that? Probably not. That's pretty risky. You have no idea how old I am. Um, so let's say I said my age was somewhere between 32 and 38 years old. Would you be willing to bet your grade now that I'm somewhere between 32 and 38? Okay, maybe. Um, maybe. I do look pretty young, so when people say, when people give a guesstimate of how old they think I am, it's pretty amusing. I get all different sorts of answers. Um, so let's try again. What if I said my age was somewhere between 20 and 50? Who wants to bet their grade in the class now? All right, so you're more than likely going to go with that last option, right? Because you have a wider range to be able to guess within that you're likely going to get it right. So the larger that interval becomes, the less precise it is. And the more precise it is, the smaller that interval is. So in general, we want those confidence intervals to be very small. So we want the lines to be very close in proximity coming out from the box. But if they're spread really far out, that means that we have a lot of variation and it's not very precise. And if it's not very precise, then we may have a really small sample size if that's the case. So remember, we want the the confidence interval to be small, and that in turn is going to create a better estimate of our effect size. 
So what you really want is a bunch of big boxes and short lines. Um, but you're actually going to see the exact opposite inevitably sometimes in your forest plots because a lot of the time those are going to be studies that had small effect sizes and it's just the nature of the social sciences research. All right, so what are some of the factors that affect precision? So the larger the sample size, the better and more precision that we're going to have. In relationship to that, the other thing that will affect precision has to do with study design. So if we have two independent samples, that's what we tend to work with. Okay. However, if we have pre-post or match groups, the higher the correlations between the pre-post scores, the more precise they will be. And if we have clustered groups, we actually don't want those to be highly related. We want those interclass correlations to be low. So those are some of the factors that go into how the effect size precision is affected. All right, so that ends the lecture for this week. Um, but I will discuss a few things before we end. So this week you have a few assignments. Let's talk about calculation assignment one and two first. So these assignments are in the module and you're going to want to set aside time to do these. These involve doing hand calculations of going through and learning how to move some of these effect sizes and convert them. And you're going to want to have a mechanical pencil or just a regular pencil with an eraser. Um, I know it's been probably a long time since you've used pencil. Um, I know I picked up using pens for math a while back and it's just no good because I did these by hand myself this week to kind of give myself a refresher and you'll definitely want to use your eraser because I had to erase a few things um, <clears throat> but just a few hints on these assignments you will want to make sure that you pay attention to the slides that have the formulas on them in the part one lecture you'll need the J and G formulas and you'll also need to know how to calculate D. So if you remember when I brought up the calculator, the online calculator, you'll want to go to that online calculator to calculate your D for some of your problems based on the data that you have from the article excerpts. So those are two big hints. And then you also have hints within each question um, for the ones that use the article excerpts that tell you which data column to use. Um, I figured I would add that to save you the grief of trying to figure out if you should do the immediate post-test or if you should do the follow-up. The key that I'll hand out is going to have the post-test data, not the follow-up data, so I'll just save you the grief and tell you which data set to use. So that is for both calculation assignments one and two. And the way that these work is you need to make sure that you're putting forth good effort, but as long as you show your work and put forth good effort, then you will receive full credit for those. And you'll actually self grade them. So I will be posting keys to both calculation assignments one and two at the end of the week when you've received week four, I'll make sure that you know to go back to week three and find the keys um, for those calculation assignments so that you can check how you did. And the main purpose of doing these is so that you can just kind of see what happens when you convert some of these things so that you understand the principles behind them. But you're never going to have to end up hand calculating these later on, so I've made these as simple as I can given these constructs that we're learning. And of course I'm always available for questions if you have any. 
So please let me know if I can help you out in any way, but I have simplified the assignments by giving you hints more so than I used to in the past. So that covers both calculation assignments one and two. And then for your discussion forum, you're actually going to be posting and responding to yourself this week. And you can choose an article. <coughs> you can choose an article <coughs> from the project that you've been working on individually, or you can end up choosing it for the group project that you will actually be assigned in at the beginning of this week. You'll actually provide a vote on which topic you want to do, and then I will be the deciding factor as to which project we will do for the term. Um, but you can actually pick an article for either project. I'm fine with that. And you will post from that, um, and then you will respond to that as well. And the reason why I don't have you respond to other students is because some people decide to just pick an article and post it and don't really go through the work of seeing how easy or difficult it's going to be to calculate an effect size and you're more than likely to be nice to yourself. So that's why I have you respond to yourself. And you'll also see me responding in there as well. Um, so that is the main thing. I also think I mentioned so we will be assigning groups this week. So um, I will be posting a ballot at the beginning of the week and I want you to go in and vote by the deadline for that. And then I will be the deciding factor on which project that we carry forward for the term. And then we will start group work next week. So this week I specifically want you to talk with one another about two different days during the week when you can commit to meeting in person um, to work on these things. You're going to want to dedicate in-person time if you are both in Fresno simply because this work is challenging and technology can bring in challenges. You're going to be connecting with me via technology but we want to minimize that as much as possible. So in-person meetings are going to be critical. So my task for you this week is for both of you to talk and compare notes and date books with one another to find out what are two different times during the week that you can devote several hours to meeting together. At least a three block time for each time in case you need those. And then um, we will also compare notes with my schedule as well so that I can see if I can pop in to these group meetings since I will be part of your group. And so that covers the end of this lecture for the week and I will see you in the discussion forum.